So let me just set the stage a bit to say, what is the question we're interested in? Um, it is how many additional deaths occurred uh, during COVID-19, uh, at least in, during the first year, which I'm going to date from March of 2020, uh, which is when we saw the first significant deaths in the US from COVID through February of 2021. Now, you might just ask, why can't we just count up the number of deaths that have been attributed to COVID? And, and that's our answer. There's a couple of reasons for that. Um, first, uh, there's, particularly early in the epidemic, um, some deaths might not have been attributed to COVID where it really was the cause. Later on, it's even possible that some deaths were attributed to COVID, but actually other things were more important. But the more important piece of that is that um, there are indirect effects which could either raise or lower deaths. So for example, uh, we have evidence that early in the pandemic, people weren't going to the emergency room for other conditions for fear of getting infected. And so, for example, if you had a heart attack and delayed going to the emergency room, uh, you might uh, die of a heart attack where you wouldn't have otherwise. And there's a whole host of other things that could be going on, some of which we'll talk about. On the other hand, some kinds of deaths might have actually fallen. So for example, uh, influenza deaths, flu deaths probably fell, uh, at least initially, because people were social distancing, they were being so much more careful about infections. So we need to, to sort of take all these things into account. So the basic idea here is we want to count up excess deaths, and that's very simple. This, this is as much math as I'm going to give you today. But excess deaths, E, are equal to actual, actual deaths minus the number you would have expected if COVID-19 hadn't occurred. Um, the problem here is, and there's a little bit of difficulty sometimes measuring actual deaths very quickly, but that's a minor issue. The big one is how do we know what the counterfactual is? That, that is, how do we figure out how many deaths there would have been if, if we hadn't had the pandemic? And that turns out to be quite a, a complicated issue. It's one that I, I spent quite a lot of time on uh, in this project. In fact, initially, this is, this is the first step for some additional work I wanted to do looking at um, how we separate sort of pandemic versus rece recession effects. But to get that or to get other kinds of things like that, we need to know how many excess deaths there were. So I started out taking a very simple idea. We just essentially inflate the prior year's deaths by say population growth. That turned out not to work out well at all for a variety of reasons. So I've adopted a different approach. And one of the things that this has allowed me is to come up with, I think, some ways we can tell if our estimates are plausible. And so at the end of this talk, I'll say a few words about some of the prior estimates and why I think maybe we need to be careful about trusting them. But so the goals here are first to, to measure, to quantify the number of these excess deaths. Um, and, and we'll do that also as a, as a percentage increase or share increase over the baseline. Look at differences by uh, demographic characteristics like sex and race and age, uh, and also look at uh, different causes of deaths. And then um, I'll also present information on the share of these deaths that are being attributed to COVID-19. So, so if 100% of the, of the excess deaths were COVID-19, that would say, all the additional deaths are due to the due to the virus itself and none for any other reasons. But we're going to find that that's not true. There is some additional, uh, there, are, there are some additional sources that are going to be quite relevant for us. As I mentioned, there's some methodological improvements, I believe. Um, and in particular, I'm going to argue it's valuable to compare this baseline number, the counterfactual expected number of deaths to the actual number of deaths in the prior year, that'll give us some information whether we're getting plausible estimates or not. And so I'll say a bit about that as we go on. So I'm gonna be using a variety of data sources. I'm not gonna say much about them, but primarily the, the key ones here are uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention data on uh, mortality rates earlier on. And more recently, they've put out uh, provisional death counts uh, a whole series of those that we'll use to get the, the, the more recent information. There's some limitations of those that, that uh, well, you can look at the working paper if you're interested in seeing about that. Okay, so just let me start with a, an issue that turned out, turned up 
uh, that I have not seen discussed in the prior estimates of excess deaths. And that is, um, we have a big year over year difference in year over year changes in monthly deaths. So in any given, say, in any given June, there's going to be some number of deaths that we can compare to the prior year. Typically for most months, we get, uh, these are increases here, we'll get an increase of three to 4,000 uh, deaths relative to the prior year. And if you think about it, that makes perfect sense. Population's going up, there's some population aging and so forth. What I want you to note here is to look at month one, that's January. Um, the mean is a little bit higher than other months, not, not hugely though, it's about 4,000, but the standard deviation is enormous. So in most months, we're talking about uh, standard deviations on the order of you know a couple thousand, maybe 3,000 versus January, it's 21,000. It's huge, there's this huge variation. There, there's actually some of that uh, excess volatility in, um, in December and February as well, but much less. So one of the things I, I uh, do in this is to try to make some adjustments for that excess volatility in January. Um, now, the other thing to point out here is if you look at the actual changes in deaths. So these are changes in deaths relative to the prior year. And in everything I talk about here, a year is actually going to refer to a March through February period. And that's done since March 2020 through February 2021 is the first year of the uh, COVID pandemic. Um, and I'm not sure how easy it is to, to see these numbers, but, but these are telling you uh, the percentage changes relative to the prior year. And what I want you to notice here is that uh, a couple of things. First, if you look at the left-hand column here, these are the actual changes. They're positive in, uh, in most years. So, so if we're looking at over this 10-year period, in eight of the 10 years, they're positive. But they actually vary quite a lot. The, the right-hand column here shows you when I do this adjustment for the excess January volatility, which helps a lot. Uh, we still have a lot of volatility uh, or a lot of variance in the, um, in the actual changes we observe over time. Why is this important? The reason this matters is it tells you that this counterfactual that we're going to come up with we're not going to estimate it that precisely. We're going to have fairly large confidence intervals. Um, and, and actually, when we look at specific causes or groups, they're even larger. Uh, it, there's also an implication then, if we're looking at some of the earlier estimates where they have very tight confidence intervals, they're actually not very credible because there just is this large uh, variance that we can't perfectly explain. So that'll be relevant as we go forward. Okay, so just very quickly, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but if we look at the methods here, the strategy is to regress um, these adjusted mor mortality counts. So these are adjusted for that excess January volatility on time trends, and these can be linear or quadratic time trends. And what I do here is I allow uh, the, the period to vary, the starting year can vary anywhere between 2009 and 2016. And I'll estimate linear and also quadratic time trends and then choose the model that has the best fit. So once I have that best fitting model, I'm gonna use it to project the pandemic year baseline deaths, these expected deaths, the counterfactual, and then the excess deaths are simply the actual number versus that uh, minus that expected number. Um, and then I can also look to make sure that these, these uh, baseline death estimates are in the range of what we would expect to see from prior historical changes. And that's actually what this, what this graph here does, what this figure does. Um, and all, the only point I wanna make here, well, I'll make two points. One is they're generally, they, they look pretty good. So if we look at the historical changes over this 10 year previous period, those are the, the ones in, in blue or purple, whatever that is, and compare them to the actual changes we see, the baseline in 2020 versus the previous year, that the orange, they're in the same general ballpark as each other. So that suggests that, that, that they, the estimates are gonna pass this plausibility test. I do wanna point out though, there's a, some of these have very wide confidence intervals. Like look at the, the flu pneumonia. You can see here the actual, that, that's, the, that's this one here. I, I don't know if you can see what I'm marking here. Uh, there's a huge confidence interval going from 
quite strongly positive to, to extremely strongly negative. And that comes about simply because when we look at things like a flu, um, seasonal flu variation, there's enormous variation across years. And again, that's going to make it hard to accurately uh, uh, predict, or I should say to precisely predict um, the baseline estimate for, uh, for 2020. Okay, so now let me get to some of the actual numbers. There's a lot of numbers here. You know, basically these are things you can look at at your leisure or or go to the working paper. And I'm going to show you some pictures in just a minute. But just to to set the stage, um, in in uh, the March 2020 through February 2021 period, there were about three and a half million deaths. Um, that's about 650,000, a little bit less. Um, more than we would than uh, we would have expected at baseline, and about uh, 500 and uh, just under 540,000 of those were directly attributed to COVID. The one other set of numbers I'll point out here is if you look at the age greater than 65 group, those account for the vast majority of both actual and excess deaths, uh, which is not surprising. We know, you know, it's it's the seniors who who die the most and and are hit the most by COVID. That's going to be relevant as we go forward and look at. Uh, kind of the, the percentage differences in actual deaths versus expected deaths. We might see big differences in some of the other numbers, but, but just to point out, it's on a small base. Okay, so this is showing you um, the share of excess deaths uh, relative to expected deaths by group. And, and let me be clear, because I, I think the title here might be slightly unclear. What I'm looking at, so a number, what we see for like all deaths is a number like 1.22. What that says is there's 22% more de actual deaths than we would have expected. So, there, so there's 22% excess deaths, uh, essentially, in that year. That's, that's for all individuals. Um, and you can see these ratios, so a ratio greater than one is indicating that you have some excess deaths, which is what we generally are going to expect. For every group, we see that, um, that the ratios are, are greater than one and considerably greater than one. Um, what, what is quite interesting here, though, is when you look, for example, across uh, race ethnicity groups, you see very large numbers of excess deaths, very proportionately large numbers of excess deaths for blacks and, and uh, particularly Hispanics and other races. On the other hand, there's actually um, a relatively small number of excess, percentage of excess deaths for the under 25 year olds compared to the older individuals. Now that's not a, a complete surprise when you think about it because um, uh, individuals under 25 have not been at major risk of dying directly from COVID. Uh, we are going to see they are at risk from some other things as we come up. So we'll get to that in just a moment. So, so that's, this is showing you the, uh, the ratio of actual deaths to what we would have expected uh, based on prior, uh, based on our counterfactual or, or based on prior history. Now, if we look at what percentage of these excess deaths are due to COVID, you see something quite interesting. So the overall number here is uh, about 83%. This is a plus or minus a confidence interval, but the estimate is about 83% of all excess deaths are attributed to COVID. Uh, I should say that number is considerably higher than many of the other estimates that are out there. And the reason for that, and I'll say more about this later probably, is that those other, es those other excess death estimates, I think, have often um, uh, understated the baseline number of deaths and so overstated the total number of excess deaths. But then when we look at groups here, what you see is um, that, that again, for Blacks and Hispanics and other races, a fairly large share of their excess deaths are not directly attributed to COVID, they're to other kinds of things. And we see that really sharply here for the less than 25 year olds. Remember I mentioned they didn't have uh, a huge percentage of excess deaths, but among those deaths that do occur, very few of them are due to COVID. And we'll see when we look at causes, some of the things they might be related to. Okay, so this is showing you um, selected causes of death. 
Um, and again, I'm not going to dwell on this table because I'm going to show you a picture, but I will mention a few things here. So the number one cause of deaths is, is heart disease. We know that there are about 700,000 in, um, uh, in, in this one year period, about 33,000 uh, excess deaths. As we go down, I want because I'm going to say a lot as we uh, continue about some of the external causes of deaths, but I want to note that the, the absolute numbers of deaths are much smaller. So we're looking at a much smaller base there. All right, so let me show you what this looks like in terms of a picture. So these are showing you the uh, excess deaths by cause as a ratio, again, of the, of the baseline. So essentially, this is total deaths divided by baseline, divided by our counterfactual. So for heart disease, we have 1.05. That means there were 5% more uh, deaths than we would have expected uh, without the pandemic. And so you see for a lot of these, these are not generally huge numbers. Uh, they vary, for, for example, diabetes is actually is actually quite large. I mean, that's on the order of uh, 15%. The really, some of the really interesting ones though are some of these external causes of death. So let me point out a few of them. If you look at drug deaths, uh, drug deaths are on the order of 30% above what we would have expected. And um, th this is where my research is continuing. A big chunk of this is likely to be due a recession effect. We know when the economy doesn't do as well, uh, drug deaths increase fairly dramatically. So that could be part of the story there. Homicide deaths also have increased uh, quite dramatically. So we're talking on the order of you know 25 percent or so um, uh, above, the, uh, above the counterfactual number. Quite interestingly, though, suicides are actually below what we would have expected. Um, and this is relevant. You know, there's a lot of discussion of deaths of despair, and people will group things like drugs and suicides and alcohol or certain kinds of alcohol deaths. If you look here, suicides are following a very different pattern than drug deaths. They're declining. Um, that's a bit of a mystery. It may partly be that actually suicides started declining even earlier in 2019, and maybe we're not fully capturing that. But what it does tell us, that if you if you read the media reports, there's a lot of uh, a belief that uh, that suicides and mental health generally have have uh, gotten much worse during the pandemic, and we're not seeing evidence of it here. The last one I'll point out, which is also quite interesting, is that vehicle fatalities have increased. Uh, fairly significantly. Now that's a surprise because usually during economic downturns, vehicle fatalities fall and fall sharply. And we know that miles driven fell particularly, uh, particularly at the beginning of the pandemic. And so you would have expected vehicle fatalities to have fallen. The fact that they haven't uh, suggests that, that risky driving increased. So, so there's certainly at least anecdotal and maybe, maybe harder evidence than that, that people were on empty roads and they, and they were speeding, you know, they were driving really fast or driving recklessly. And so that might be the, the cause of that. Okay, so just to briefly summarize, what have we learned? There were, there were something over 600,000 excess deaths during the first year of COVID. Uh, and again, I, the, the, paper discusses this in a lot of a lot more detail than I have here, but it's likely that prior many of the prior estimates actually overstated this number and also the COVID share of these deaths. And then that occurred because they were probably underestimating baseline deaths. Um, I think in, in work generally on this issue and more generally, if we're going to look at excess death calculations, this notion of comparing your counterfactual to what actually occurred in the previous year, that gives you a good plausibility check uh, that, that I think is important going forward. Uh, as I've mentioned, there were particularly large increases for non-whites uh, that, that was known, but I think less well understood has been the fact that we had these increases in drug uh, and homicide deaths uh, while suicide deaths have declined. So why don't I stop there and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to talk with you and I hope you'll go, we'll go look at the working paper for more details.